morning to all of those uh, in Australia and through Asia that have registered for our webinar. Um, good afternoon to those that are uh, based in the US and um, I'd, I'd say a, a late good evening to those that are, that are in Europe that have uh, joined us for our webinar this morning. January's, uh, January's webinar uh, will be focused around the current changing landscape for medical device technology reimbursements in Australia. Presenting will be Sarah Griffin, who is a, a principal consultant um, here at Brandwood Biomedical. Sarah uh, is a health economist consultant specialising in devices. Sarah comes with 25 years experience in the health sector, focusing on health insurance, medical finance and reimbursements and government relations. Sarah is also a member in several different industry groups uh, and their uh, uh, reimbursement and health economics um, committees. A little bit about Brandwood Biomedical. So Brandwood Biomedical is a uh, medical device regulatory firm based here in, in Sydney, Australia, which is our headquarters. We've got offices in New Zealand uh, and in Beijing. Um, we have a focus on regulatory and reimbursement. We have a global perspective uh, offering services uh, for global clients in a various number of different markets. We're also highly networked and uh, participate in a number of different uh, industry groups, both here in Australia and abroad. So without further ado, uh, I'll now hand over to Sarah Griffin to take you through this morning's webinar. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. So this is a quick overview of the agenda. We're going to have a very quick orientation to the Australian system for the benefit of those who don't live here, a review of the activity in 2016, and then summing it all that up, we'll have a look at what we think is likely to happen in 2017. Okay, so just talking about Australia, as most people know, it's a pretty mature and sophisticated market, and innovative technology is very much valued. And it's been a really good place for device manufacturers to do business. But like every other country, we have demographic pressures and the same budget constraints as other advanced economies. And this is certainly reflected in what we're seeing in the reimbursement environment at the moment. And as I said, we'll just set the scene for Australia for those of us who aren't fortunate enough to live here. So we've got a universal healthcare system called Medicare that roughly half of all Australians also opt to have private health insurance. So private health insurance in Australia is pretty much limited to hospital cover with bits and pieces of um, ancillary cover like physiotherapy and dental. So consequently, we have a mix of public and private hospital systems. It's somewhat fragmented and siloed, and as a result, we do have some perverse economic incentives built into the system. So we'll focus a lot today on medical technologies in private hospitals because that's where pretty much all the action is. So to be covered by um, health insurance in a private hospital system, a procedure has to be listed on the medical benefit schedule, which is run by Medicare. And so it's got to be included on the MBS to be covered by private health insurance. So included in that cover for private health insurance is implantable devices. So manufacturers will be paid a benefit over and above any payment for the procedure for implantable devices. So hips, pacemakers, grafts, anything like that. Some other products like vascular closure devices. There's 9,000 products. All of these go up to make the prosthesis list. This is really good if, um, for manufacturers if you have implantable devices. However, it's a lot more difficult for um, manufacturers that don't have implantable devices that may be sick in a high cost single use item. So we'll discuss that a little bit more a bit later. Okay, so let's have a look at what happened in 2016. And in 2016, Australia was the land of endless health system reviews. There were seven separate reviews being conducted by the Federal Department of Health last year. But we're only going to concentrate on two of them today because they're the most relevant. The first being the private health insurance review and the second being the medical benefit schedule review. Okay, so 
The private health insurance review started off in 2015 and at the instigation of the Minister and the goal was to enhance the value of private ins health insurance to consumers because like everywhere else, the cost of insurance has been going up and up and you know, quite often benefits have been going down. So it was, the idea was to increase the efficiency of private health insurance and to increase the effectiveness of the considerable amount of public subsidy of private health insurance and also to overall improve the sustainability of the private health sector. However, it quickly, the public discussion quickly got taken over by a very effective campaign by the private health insurance industry in Australia. So there was lots and lots of media around the high cost of prostheses in the private sector. You know, there was, you know, sometimes almost hysterical claims in the media. And but like all good campaigns, there were some elements of truth in it. So it's, it was a very, very effective campaign. For example, um, the CEO of Private Health Australia, which is the peak body for private health insurers, claimed that Australian private patients have been paid two and five times as much as um, to medical devices as in other countries. You know, and while they may, you know, it's a very complicated use of data. It certainly doesn't prevent the, present the whole picture, but overall, it was a very effective and um, compelling campaign by the private health insurers that prostheses prices were indeed responsible for the increase in private health insurance premiums. In reality, prostheses is only 14% of private health insurance, but it is, I, I believe the way it was targeted is it's because something that the private health insurers felt they could influence, whereas it's much harder to influence hospital costs such as salaries and um, infrastructure. Okay, so as expected, the prosthesis list was the very first target of the outcomes of the private health insurance review. The former health minister, who we'll, we'll discuss it a bit later, Susan Lay, um, had a press release in February um, 2016 saying the Australian government will look to make thousands of medical devices more affordable, which will also reduce pressure on private health insurance premiums. So you can see that the government bought into the link between the cost of prostheses and the cost of private health insurance. So as a result of that announcement, an industry working group was established on prostheses and a whole bunch of stakeholders were included, obviously industry, the insurers, hospitals, doctors and consumers. So you know, a very difficult group to have in a room trying to negotiate something because obviously everyone has different interests and different pull and push factors. However, they did come out with a, you know, quite a effective statement, I thought. So they acknowledged that there was a lack of transparency in the current system. Uh, they acknowledged that some categories you know, could probably handle a benefit reduction. And there was recognition that devices, unlike drugs, do have a lot of inbuilt cost in clinical support, shipping, provision of instruments, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They also looked at the definition of prosthesis, which we will discuss a bit later, as being inflexible and it needs to be examined. Okay. Also, there was reform of the prosthesis list committee, and um, the number one focus. You know, there's a lot of. Um, political speak, but it was very clear that the number one focus for the revamp committee will be to improve affordability and access to medical devices and also to improve the transparency of the listing process. New chairman is Professor Terry Campbell, who is a long time inter member of the Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Committee and that's telling that they've um, used a member from PBAC because PBAC has had a very um, long campaign in transparency, sorry, price transparency and um, modification of pharmaceutical prices in Australia. Okay, so there have been some immediate price reductions. Um, there was initially talk of 40% across the board, which you know the minister to her credit realised there'd be all sorts of unintended consequences 
throughout the industry if such a blunt instrument was used. And certainly the findings of the um, industry working groups and support that. So what's happened is there's been a decrease in intraocular lenses and cardiac devices of 10% and hip and knee replacements of 7.5%. There doesn't seem to have been a particular methodology or rationale for reaching these particular um, decreases. However, it's probably a mix of political and pragmatic to you know, offer the private health insurers something and not damaging the industry too much. So this is what um, the department came up with. And that's being implemented from the February 2016 prosthesis list. Okay, we'll move on to the um, medical benefits schedule review. Now just to remind everyone, the medical benefits schedule in Australia is part of the Australia-wide medical um, Medicare system and it's a list of 5,700 medical procedures and attendances that are subsidised by Medicare. And you know it's well in line for a review, it hasn't been reviewed for many years and um, both sides of politics support a review to make sure that the items included on the MBS are you know, up to date, aligned with contemporary clinical practice and actually do improve health outcomes. For outcomes for patients. So it's a massive task and it's been proceeding you know, reasonably quickly. An interim report was released in September that you know, it really didn't give anything much other than a plan for moving forward. So at the time there was a diagnostic imaging committee, gastroenterology, ear, nose and strokes, obstetrics and thoracic medicine. So each committee had a group of um, item numbers to look at and some areas where they were um, focusing on. So you know, some thing, early things that came out was um, there was lots of discussion about x-rays for low back pain and whether that's a worthwhile um, activity for the Commonwealth to be spending taxpayers' money on. And at the same, same time, some very non-contentious obsolete items were deleted from the list. The three take homes from the interim report that I think is worth um, looking at. So the report recommended a whole bunch of items on which the data should be gathered to make some decisions about those particular item numbers. They also recommended some new item numbers to be rapidly assessed by MSAC. Um, MSAC is not known for rapidly assessing anything, so we'll have to see how that pans out. Um, but it's interesting that they did recommend that. And the thing I think that's really, really important for um, device manufacturers is looking at including the high price disposables in the fee for the procedure because there's lots of procedures that are carried out in doctor's offices that because they're out of hospital procedures and not covered by private health insurance and the only coverage is from the medical benefits schedule. And if the high cost device is not included, it very often falls to the patient to pay that or else the procedure is unaffordable. Um, just off the top of my head, I'm thinking of you know, ablation catheters for varicose veins. Um, there's some other things um, similar, you know, similarly, you know, high cost wound care. So you know, that's the interested, um, it would be very interesting to see if that pans out because if it does, I think it would be a very reasonable and logical way for covering these items. So moving on to, we just mentioned the Medical Services Advisory Committee. For those people who aren't familiar with this body, this is a ministerial body um, appointed by the government to look at an application to list a new procedure on the medical benefits schedule. You know, it's um, taking on an MSAC application is, is no um, easy project. It's very daunting. Um, a typical application will take two years and can cost upwards of $200,000 in consulting fees. So you know, the process has always been extremely clunky, not user friendly and it's been very difficult for um, 
sponsors to navigate. So some reforms to the application process were implemented in mid-2016. Um, just reading the documents around the reform process was quite challenging. They're incredibly bureaucratic and difficult to read. But once you delve through all that bureaucracy and the you know, difficult documents, there's actually some quite good op options for new applicants to MSAC. So, and I think they'll pan out over time to have some good um, outcomes. So first of all, the barrier to entry to getting an MSAC application form up and running is much harder. Basically, the initial application form used to be pretty straightforward and very simple, and pretty much all applications were accepted. So in order to reduce the amount of work that the MSAC Secretariat is dealing with, the initial application form is much more complex and resource intensive and asks for a lot more um, resources up front. So, and also it's a requirement to have the support of the clinical craft group right from the outset. So say for example, if you're doing a new orthopaedic procedure, you're going to need the um, Australian Orthopaedic Society on board right from the beginning. So, you know, the initial application form is probably a good 50 hours of work. So, you know, a big change from the last one. So, following the submission of the initial application, which, you know, includes a whole bunch of evidence, um, a very detailed description of the technology, um, you know, the population it's that it's likely to be used in, you know, very detailed. Following that submission, the department, in their own words, verify, verifies the availability of evidence for assessment. So what you can read from that, if it's quite apparent that you know, there's no way in this wide world that the evidence is ever going to meet the um, bar that MSAC sets, then that application isn't allowed to go through. Um, this is probably good because there's nothing worse than getting a very slow, expensive no. So, you know, pretty much you get a fast no if, if the evidence base isn't really there at all. And so that's probably a better result for the sponsors rather than, you know, going right through the process. After that's been done, whether they do, the department determines whether the um, application is eligible to proceed or not, they determine the most appropriate pathway. Now the most appropriate pathway is yet to be determined and how to see how that plays out because the applications going through this new process is quite new. But one thing that we do have to do is get something called a PICO confirmation. It's a very awkward name, but this is what the department's come out with. So basically what a PICO confirmation is, once you've submitted your um, initial application and seen ready to go ahead, a PICO confirmation outlines the main clinical and economic questions that must be addressed in the main submission. And PICO is strong, what population are you treating? What is the intervention? And what is the comparator? What would you be doing if you weren't using that intervention? And what is the outcomes, both clinical and economic, of that intervention? And so what this did, does, the PICO confirmation, it specifies each of the parameters and informs the decision analytic framework of the economic evaluation and determines what sort of economic evaluation needs to happen. Because there's various types and some are more complex than others. And so having knowing what's going to happen at this stage is quite helpful. The one thing that is quite concerning is that the PICO confirmation is not developed by the sponsor. It's, sponsored, it's contracted out to a health technology assessment group. And while the new process allows for a lot more consultation than has happened in the past, um, it's still quite worrying to me because in the past when HTA groups have um, completed um, what used to be called the protocol, which is now called the PICO confirmation. There's often been um, a lack of understanding of the technology involved or how it really works in the population. 
Hopefully that will be overcome by the more consultative process, but as I said, it's still early days and we haven't seen the results of a lot of this as yet. One thing that I think that's very useful um, is a split submission. Previously, when you submitted your full report, you had to include the clinical assessment, the economic modelling, budget impact analysis, all in one go. And this is a very, very expensive and time consuming process. And what often happened was after this major submission was included, that the MSAC determined that the initial clinical evidence wasn't robust enough or they didn't accept the conclusions. And so the whole application was rejected. Now it would be really useful for applicants to know that before they built their economic model, which is the most expensive and time consuming part of an application, that the clinical evidence on which that model was based wasn't deemed sufficient. So now MSAC gives um, response of the opportunity of first submitting the clinical evidence and getting a ruling from MSAT on whether they believe it is sufficient to support public funding and then moving on to doing the economic model. And I think this is something that um, a lot of sponsors will take up because as again, it's a, either a short, less costly note than a big expensive slow note. So we'll also have to see how that pans out. So that's what's happened in 2016. So let's move on and welcome to 2017. Well, in Australia, we start. We never seem to have a quiet start to the political year. So the very first thing that happened this year was that the health minister Susan Lay had to resign over an expenses scandal which I actually think was a bit of a shame because she's quite a thoughtful minister and um, even though I didn't agree with a lot of things she did, I think she really understood um, the concerns of the medical device industry and listened to them and took a lot of things that um, the industry had said to her on board. So unfortunately, um, she has resigned and gone to the back bench. Arthur Sinodinas, who is a senator, has been appointed as the interim minister. Um, he, I think, would make quite a good health minister, but in the news this morning, um, there's rumours that it's not going to be him, it's going to be a, um, the ex-environment minister, Greg Hunt. So we remain to um, see what happens there. Um, Interestingly, Arthur Sinodinus had been the scandal himself and stood down from his cabinet position a couple of years ago, but he was since found to be um, in the clear. So ministers aren't having a good run at the moment. So it will be very dependent on the type and nature of the minister that takes over the health portfolio as to how things proceed next year. This year, sorry, 2017, they're here. But it is very clear that all the action will be in the prosthesis area. So regardless of the minister, you know, what, you know, government departments tend to roll on, you know, um, regardless of who's leading them. So there's a lot of things that have been put in place. So very recently, the Department of Health has committed the University of Melbourne Centre for Health Policy. So this is interesting. Research pricing models for medical devices and develop options for the design of framework for prosthesis benefits with the Australian private health setting. Now those words I think are a bit clumsy, but obviously what the um, department is looking for, and this is quite will be quite a difficult thing to do is to take all of the findings of the industry working group and incorporate them in some sort of methodology for pricing processes. Um, you know, it's, that's no easy challenge because the um, industry has been developed over you know, many years with the public and private healthcare option with the processes list being in place for many, many years. So the industry has has set its triggers and drivers around that. 
So it will be very interesting to see what the um, Centre for Health Policy comes up with. Um, obviously, they're looking for more comp competition in um, reimbursement. So um, I imagine they'll be looking closely at the uh, pharmaceutical benefits scheme. So one thing the um, University of Melbourne has done with the department has asked a whole bunch of industry groups and interested parties to submit any ideas or um, points of view that may be helpful for the um, for the University of Melbourne in driving this new framework. So um, they've also asked for any confidential data that companies might wish to provide. So I'm not sure how that goes or how that will go for them, but at least they are reaching out to the industry for information. Okay, as if um, an industry working group, a private health insurance review and a university project weren't enough, Senator Nick Xenophon has launched a Senate inquiry into prosthesis pricing. Now, um, Senator Xenophon has crossed paths, if you want a better word, with the um, device industry over many years, um, basically over registration of um, products and now he's focusing on the pricing. So interestingly enough, the Senate inquiry has virtually the same terms of reference as the industry working group, but with a few political elements thrown in. So one of the um, terms of reference is to investigate the relationship of industry lobbyists and um, or political relationships between companies and the government and members of the department. So that will be very interesting to see um, what comes out of that. Um, the Senate is reporting in March 2017. So this could be quite difficult for some companies if they're called before the Senate committee. You know, I don't think it's obligatory for um, companies to appear, but it's a bit likely damned if you do and damned if you don't. So I'm sure most companies, if asked, would appear. But it may make for some uncomfortable headlines. There was a, um, particularly if um, device prices are cherry picked from one country to another, because you know it's a very complex market in Australia, and it's very difficult, and it's not good economic policy to compare raw prices between one jurisdiction and another. However, I think that's probably likely to happen. Um, it also remains to be seen whether there's any relevant outcomes from this Senate inquiry other than what's already been happening in the working group and with the University of Melbourne. So that's definitely something to watch. And you know, for those of us who are interested in the politics around this, it should be very, very interesting. And there's further reform of the processes list um, planned for later for um, 2017. Interesting, they're looking at the pricing first, which you know, a government always has an eye on prices, of course. But there's going to be a long-awaited review of the prosthesis list criteria planned for this year. Now, this is really quite good news because the prosthesis list criteria have been problematic for years and years and years, and mainly the requirement that a device be permanently implanted. And as technology moves on and there's more and more less invasive technology, particularly disposable devices that may be used to ablate or um, freeze or change tissue in some way that are not left in the body but are discarded after surgery, those have never been able to be included on the prosthesis list and it's you know, resulted in some really, really quite silly anomalies where some devices are paid for and others aren't. So, um, and quite often has incentivised outcomes that aren't in the best interest of the patient simply because of the way the devices are paid for. So a, a good faith review of the prosthesis list criteria would be very welcome and I'm sure the industry will participate in it willingly. Okay, with the MBS review, um, no further reports have been published, however, multiple working groups have been established in pretty much every speciality 
quality, um, with most of them having their initial meetings in late 2016 and 2017. None of those working groups have reported as yet, but I'm guessing they'll have likely to have recommendations late in 2017 or maybe mid-2017 if we're lucky. And it's probably likely some of the recommendations will be contentious. You know, there's been a lot of discussion, for example, about arthroscopy of the knee for arthritis and how it's ineffective, but there's many, many, many procedures done each year for that, and that's been in the target of the MBS review. So as soon as some of these um, item numbers are going to start being recommended for deletion, which they almost certainly will be, um, it's going to start affecting doctors groups and also for any device suppliers who may be providing those the sort of equipment that is used during those procedures. Um, Susan Lee, the former minister, promised that it wouldn't nothing would be implemented in a rush. So what she, if you read between the lines, she was saying that um, doctors would be given time to adjust and anything would be implemented slowly. And I do believe that will probably be the case because um, you know the doctors' groups are very powerful in Australia. So I don't think there'll be any hurry in implementing things, uh, particularly deletions of procedures that have been carried on for many years. But it will certainly happen. So that's something we need to. If you're a supplier in those areas, you need to keep a watch on. So I think, yeah, oh sorry, I just wanted to cover the MSAT reform. So the early trends we're seeing just at the beginning of the implementation of these reforms, the MSAT process, it's been going for six months and the experience that people have been having is that the MSAT secretary has been extremely helpful and accommodating to sponsors in navigating the um, new process. But one thing I do have noted is that the reforms benefit those technologies that are able to really highly define their treatment population and also as the technologies that lend themselves to um, robust randomised controlled trials. But, and some of these um, types of applications, so for example it might be a um, test to allow access to a particular drug. Now these sort of procedures are very, very, very well defined and they tend to be very specific. And these are ideal for the MSAC process. And some of these types of applications we've been hearing may be able to skip the PICO confirmation phase altogether because the questions that are being asked are articulated clearly enough just in the initial application. However, medicine is a messy business and it's much more challenging for technologies that may be used in heterogeneous populations, you know, where you cannot define the population as accurately or definitively as in other cases. Or in the other ca case is where companies don't have or technologies don't lend themselves to conducting randomised controlled trials. And you know, I always think of radiology in that respect because um, that's a very difficult area to conduct um, randomised controlled trials because physics tells you how accurate any sort of new um, radiotherapy is. But most people won't volunteer to be in a trial that might necessarily randomise them to a less accurate technology. So this, this has been a real problem for the radiotherapy um, technologies. So you know, that's where I see the challenges and as I say, you know, we haven't had many applications that have gone, or if any, that have gone through this whole process yet. So it's going to be a wait and see to see how these sort of heterogeneous populations and difficult technologies are dealt with. But I guess the best thing to do in those cases is to really try and nail down your population as close as you can, try and seek um, an AMSAC application for populations and where, where your technology is most effective. And of course, you know, always seek very good advice before embarking on any of these applications because they are very expensive and time consuming. 
And we're starting to, just one other thing, we're starting to see the descriptions of uh, that are appearing in the medical benefits schedules being highly, highly, highly specific and very, very lengthy. And this is just um, as a result of this trend to looking at highly defined treatment populations. So I guess that's what I see coming up in 2017. So I think it's going to be quite interesting this year, particularly in the prosthesis area. I think there's going to be um, some real challenges, but conversely, some real opportunities for suppliers in this area. And also, I think it will be interesting to see um, the first decisions of MSAC coming through under their new process. So actually now we can have some questions, if anyone has any, and I'll hand back to Grant. Thanks, Sarah, Thanks, for that Sarah, really informative, informative presentation. Um, just a couple of questions have come through. I um, wanted to go back to the, the MSAC submissions. Um, and obviously, they, they are a very large uh, project to undertake. If anyone's unsure about what sort of evidence they actually need to, to have in place for an MSAC, what would you suggest or recommend? Look, what I do because I just, I, I'm a great believer in just assessing what you've got and doing these things step by step, so having a go, no go process. So first of all, if you're unsure of your evidence, just get a feasibility study. It's a, you know, it's a comparatively inexpensive way of going about it and get, some, get your evidence reviewed, get an ad hoc back of the envelope, look at the economic situation and then that will give you some really good grounds on whether you want to proceed or not rather than leaping in first up. So you know, I've done um, a few of these and I think they're really valuable for clients and they're very cost effective um, for sponsors rather than just leaping in. So feasibility study first up if you're at all unsure before you move on to the next step. Okay, thanks Sarah. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Um, um, just looking at obviously all the reforms that are that are, that are underway as well, all the different activities. Um, do you have any sort of vision as to what you think they're going to? Any outcomes or any thoughts on that? Um, um, my guess would be that they'll borrow the um, Melbourne route will come up with something that's akin to the price disclosure that the pharmaceutical benefit schemes work with. I think it'll, it'll be very challenging because it's much harder in devices to actually um, come up with a simple cost. And you know, the bigger you are, the more you can gain the system. So it's going to be difficult to come up with something robust. But I'm pretty sure that um, there'll be some form of price disclosure involved or there'll have to be some or I think there also will be an opportunity for people to bid or have a competitive bid um, and the lowest price that someone is prepared to offer will um, be the price for a group of prostheses. And you know, I don't know how successful that will be because um, there's sort of that option at the moment that there may, may be some um, pressure or triggers to force companies into doing that or disclosing or or accepting an alternate default much lower benefit. And an example of what I would compare that to is the default benefits that private hospitals get if they don't negotiate prices with um, insurers. They go into much lower default benefits. So it could be possible there might be a default low prosthesis price for a group rather than if you're not prepared to enter into a competitive Bid. So it's a bit hard to know, but those are the sort of things that I think would be contemplated. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. That actually, that actually uh, brings us to the close of the webinar. This webinar. Uh, I want to just I thank everybody that's joined us today and also, and also Sarah. Sarah. Um,